Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time. Today, we'll be presenting on the virus known as myxoma virus. Our focus for our presentation will be on some of the concerns we have regarding myxoma virus, as well as future opportunities it provides us. So a brief introduction to myxoma virus and its genome and structure. Myxoma virus has a large non-segmented genome of 160 kilobases and is made of linear double-stranded DNA. Um, structurally, it has a brick-shaped virion and is enveloped and it, with 20 nanometers in diameter and 200 nanometers in length and height. Myxoma virus also has a bioconcave core present in the middle, structurally, um, and it is part of the pox virus family and lep lepora pox virus genus. Some other examples of viruses that are related to myxoma virus include smallpox virus, vaccinia virus, catpox virus, and monkeypox virus. Myxoma virus can be mechanically transferred from one organism to another through a vector, which can be any arthropod, or transmission can occur through aerosol droplets, which is when air droplets directly transfer the virus from one organism to another. It turns out that the most common method of transfer through a vector is through fleas, and they're most likely to act as the primary vector for tapetes and rabbits due to their prevalence amongst the population. Myxoma virus replicates in dendritic cells at the infection site, then spreads to local macrophages, epidermal cells, and lymph nodes. All right, so getting into the background, let's discuss the emergence of myxoma virus. Although myxoma virus is most known for the carnage it inflicted upon European rabbits, it was actually first discovered in Uruguay all the way back in 1896 when researchers were taking a look at their local tapetes. Regarding the etymology of the virus, it was dubbed myxoma virus because it caused subcutaneous gelatinous swellings in its natural reservoir hosts. In Latin, myxoma virus translates into mucus tumor virus. So if you look at, uh, take a look at these adorable pictures on the right, you'll see the reservoir host on the top and the primary host on the bottom. The reservoir hosts for myxoma virus are the South American tapiti uh, and the North American brush rabbit, which share the same genus. And the primary host, which happened via cross-species transmission, is the European rabbit. So I also wanted to give a bit of context as to why and how this cross-species transmission actually occurred. Um, the first thing we have to establish is that uh, European rabbits exist in Australia, and it's because someone from England um, released 24 of them onto Australian lands for sport, and they reproduced until they became an invasive species. By 1950, there were an estimated 600 million feral European rabbits on the continent, and they caused $200 million worth of damage to Australia's agricultural industry annually, on top of causing severe soil erosion. In response, the Australian government started funding biocontrol initiatives. These included hunting, trapping, and fencing, but these were all largely ineffective despite killing lots of rabbits. Then researchers discovered in a laboratory setting that myxoma virus extracted from South American tapetes could infect European rabbits and was actually highly lethal in them. So in this case, cross-species transmission was actually human-made. So here's a map that shows how myxoma virus actually moved from country to country. Um, in 1950, myxoma virus went from tapetes in Uruguay to European rabbits in Australia due to biocontrol measures like we talked about. Uh, in 1952, it went from Uruguay to France, um, and in 1953, it went from mainland Europe to UK. In every case, more than 90% of the European rabbit population in each country died. So pathogenesis for myxoma virus differs depending on the species. In the reservoir host, the South American tapiti, myxoma virus results in the creation of a benign mucus tumor. And you can see that right here. This is because a flea or mosquito bites a tapiti and transfers that virus into it. Um, but the virus is quickly apprehended by the immune response, and it's considered a mild self-limiting disease because it can resolve itself naturally and without any form of outside training treatment. Uh, so yeah, you can see this um, benign tumor right here on the back of the ear. 
In contrast, myxoma virus causes a severe and fatal systemic disease in European rabbits. In the image right here, you can see these awful symptoms that they cause in European rabbits. There are these open, bloody lesions across the body, and for this one, it was under the eye and ear. So here's a quick chart that shows how myxomatosis, um, which is the disease, the official name of the disease, um, and how it progresses in most European rabbits. You can see swelling of the site of infection. Um, then other sites start to swell, like the face and the anogenital region. Um, then the lesions appear um, across the body. Um, and then there's ocular and nasal discharge, then eventually death after some other symptoms. But it turns out that pathogenesis is actually quite different in some European rabbits, since there are multiple strains of myxoma virus. In order to understand why there might be differences in pathogenesis due to different strains, let's take a look at the viral life cycles and molecular mechanisms of myxoma virus. In discussing myxoma virus entry into the cell, we'll keep it general. Studies as new as 2020 state that the binding and entry mechanisms for not only myxoma, but many pox viruses are relatively unknown. Most information is based off of studies of vaccine virus, with the assumption that they apply to other pox viruses. Myxoma receptors are generally nonspecific, and entry into the cell is mediated through several viral proteins through fusion with the plasmid plasma or endosomal membrane. Fusion is activated via low pH, but no cell receptor has been identified. As a group one double-stranded DNA virus, myxoma virus, genome replication, and protein synthesis follow a transcriptional cascade, which in which there are a set of early, intermediate, and late genes. Unlike other group 1 viruses, however, myxoma virus must carry its own DDRP to kickstart transcription because it does not localize in the nucleus and therefore cannot use host DDRP. Thus, the first round of transcription occurs using viral proteins and is translated using host proteins. Early genes code for DNA polymerase and allow for genome replication to occur through a rolling hairpin mechanism. Complete uncoding also occurs at this stage, exposing the double-stranded DNA to the environment. Um, at this point, it's really important for the virus to be able to cooperate, cooperate with the host, since the host has a higher chance of detecting the double-stranded DNA in its cytoplasm. It's been reported that certain factors, such as um, MO62, protect the virus from interferon signaling via the CGAS DNA sensing. And as expected, intermediate genes allow for the transcription of late genes, and late genes produce viral transcriptases and structural proteins. Here, I will continue to emphasize the importance of immunomodulatory proteins to myxoma virus. It's so important that it takes up two-thirds of the entire genome. It's hypothesized that the virus attempts to also lower the genome replication at this point to prevent the accumulation of double-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm. Other mechanisms of trying to prevent complete destruction from um, the immune system from the host is the use of myxoma-156 as a phosphorylation decoy, which can prevent PKR from phosphorylating um, ELF to alpha, which we saw in class earlier in the quarter, um, and this would stop translation. If host translation is stopped, then viral tr translation is also stopped. Also, MO13 stops PKR activation of nf kappa B, which would allow for the interferon signaling pathway to fight against the virus. Pox viruses in general are relatively big and is implied by active processes um, must occur in order for the virus to successfully egress from the host cell. Genome and protein packaging occur simultaneously in a highly regulated process um, alongside capsid assembly, and the virus is allowed to exit the cell via um, actin tail motility, exocytosis, exocytosis, and the fusion with the wrapped membrane. So as Anna was discussing, um, the mutations in immunomodulatory proteins led to differences in virulence in known um, myxoma virus strains. In the original standard laboratory strain that was first released to rabbits in Australia, which is dubbed the grade one um, strain, the fatality rate was 99.6%, and this was the highest. After the strain was given time to evolve, after 30 years, researchers found more strains that varied in fatality rate, and they were numbered according to decreasing fatality rate. So you can see here with this second bar.
When researchers tracked the prevalence of these strains, taking note their difference in virulence and lethality, they found that after 30 years of evolution, it was found that grade 3 strain had the highest prevalence at 67% of the infected rabbit population. This is because strains like grade 1 were highly virulent, but they also killed the host rabbit too quickly, so the infectious lesions were only available for a few days. And strains like grade 5 allowed the rabbit host to live longer for more opportunities to spread, but it lost its virulence as a consequence. Grade 3 had the perfect balance of high enough virulence as well as low enough fatality, which is why this is a classic example of balancing selection. Like we learned in lecture 11, uh, multiple alleles must be maintained considering the end result. A cell-mediated immune response is critical for viral protection because without it, the virus is able to initiate the following cascade. So for example, the virus first downregulates the MHC class 1 molecules that are present on the surface of the infected cells, and this reduces the antigen presentation to CD8 plus T cells, and as a result, key immune cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, and CD4 plus T cells become infected in the rabbit's lymph nodes. So then a series of virally encoded proteins inhibit apoptosis in the lymphocytes and monocytes, which enables the virus to encode proteins that significantly inhibit key mediators in the innate immune response. And in the end, inhibitors, interferons, and cytokines will downregulate inflammation, and thus the immune response is not able to dissipate the virus within the host. However, there are immunomodulatory proteins present in 28 of the myxoma virus genes that possess enhanced functions that are related to downregulating the recognition and clearance by the innate immune response uh, in order to generate a response against the virus. And these immun immunomodulatory proteins can be divided into three groups, and each group contains additional proteins with a similar function. So for example, the first group um, are viral receptors, and they get secreted from infected cells and bind to specific immune ligands. So for example, MT1 inhibits the activity of CC chemokines that are responsible for hemostasis and act as pro-inflammatory mediators. And then the second group are virokines, and they also get secreted from infected cells, but they mimic uh, the host immune system inhibitors or growth factors. And an example is uh, MGF, which is a growth factor that induces cellular proliferation and metabolic activation. And it was found that when MGF was deleted, the rabbits developed a uh, myxomatosis. And the third group are viral mitigators, and they possess anti apoptotic function during viral infection. And an example is MT4, which localizes to the endoplasmic reticulum and inhibits apoptosis in rabbit lymphocytes. So in addition to the immunomodulatory proteins, um, myxoma virus can also suppress the immune response by downregulating the surface expression. So for example, by downregulating the MHC class 1 molecules, the recognition of infected cells by the cytotoxic T lymphocytes is inhibited, which reduces the presentation of viral peptides. And additionally, downregulating down CD4 expression in antigen-presenting cells causes those cells to lose their function and become inhibited, which results in the immune response being unable to dissipate the virus within the host. And infected rabbits were found that they can develop both IgM and IgG antibodies to the virus. However, even though these antibodies can neutralize the virus, they don't necessarily protect the virus from death in virulent cases of infection. Um, and passive immunization experiments performed on rabbits with immune serum found that rabbits that had been exposed to myxomatosis in like a breeding colony were not protected from infection against maternal antibodies. And in the production of neutralizing antibodies, they found that inactivated vaccines failed to protect the, vir the rabbit against the virus, even though antibodies were initially induced. However, immuniz immunization with attenuated viruses was proven to be protective. So therefore, based on this, we can conclude that um, the pre-existing antibodies can provide a limited uh, protection against infection, but antibodies developed during viral infection are not as critical for their survival. So we have talked about the background, life, life cycle, and molecular mechanisms of myxomal virus, but why is it important to study it at all? Well, it turns out myxomal virus actually creates several opportunities for humans. The most important of these is oncolytic vi viral therapy. As you can see on the image on the right, during this therapy, a virus is delivered to the tumor cell where it replicates and causes slices. This triggers three downstream effects. First, the lysis causes local inflammation, which leads to the destruction of the tumor microenvironment. 
Second, the lysis releases viral progeny to infect neighboring tumor cells, causing even further lysis. And third, the lysis also releases tumor antigens, which trigger a systemic anti-tumor immune response. Oncolytic virotherapy is very promising for malignant tumors, and members of pox viruses, like myxoma, are the best candidates for a number of reasons, including the fact that they are safe in humans due to their host being rabbits. Despite this, they can still target diverse tumor types originating from humans, and we can insert multiple therapeutic transgenes simultane simultaneously into myxoma without compromising its replication. Myxoma virus can also be used to treat systemic inflammatory syndromes. The virus has strong immune suppressing proteins and immunomodulators like SERP1 are being developed currently to treat a variety of inflammatory syndromes like cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, and transplantation rejection. However, there are also some concerns about myxoma virus related to rabbit health, which are important to consider because we rely greatly on rabbit antibodies and research, such as in Western blotting, ELISA, immunohistochemistry, and flow cytometry. We also use rabbits to harvest many immunosuppressive drugs used in organ transplantation. An example of these is um, antithymocyte globulin, or ATG which is a mix of polyclonal antibodies from rabbits. It's a drug that depletes T cells um, and leads to less rejection of the new organ. Rabbit ATGs are actually the most successful ATGs because of their high like, lymphocytotoxicity as compared to ATGs from other animals like goats and horses. So we want to keep rabbits healthy from myxoma virus to continue their antibody supply. And rabbits are also very popular household pets, as shown by the statistics on the right. So it's important to protect them from viral infections. There is another concern about myxoma virus, namely that it, it can expand its host range. On the picture on the right, we see that the myxoma virus jumped from South and North American rabbits to European ones. And the concern is that it may jump into even more species. This is because the evolutionary rate of myxoma virus is high for a DNA virus. It's 1 times 10 to the negative 5 nucleotide substitutions per site per year. Additionally, it has two very common vectors, the mosquitoes and fleas. And there is also great contact between rabbits and other species, including humans, particularly since European rabbits are considered to be an invasive species. All of these points lead up to the concern about potential host range expansion in myxoma virus. So with myxoma virus, some opportunities include oncolytic viral therapy and treatment of systemic inflammatory syndromes. Since the virus can target diverse human tumor cell types and the virus produces immunosuppressive proteins. However, there are also a lot of concerns surrounding myxoma virus, especially around its use in biocontrol. Deliberate introduction into an invasive rabbit population provides the virus with a large reservoir of hosts for quick viral evolution, raising concerns for cross-species transmission since ecosystems can be highly diverse with cross-species contacts occurring regularly. Using myxoma virus as a form of biocontrol led to its evolution in the form of the grade three strain that is honed to better spread as a result of balancing selection between lethality and virulence, and it still failed to solve the invasive, invasive species problem. Now a strain of the virus that is best at infecting and spreading exists, raising high concern for its use. Some future directions and remaining questions um, with myxoma virus include um, how to deliver the virus um, to localize cancer tissue with oncolytic therapy, and also understanding how viral resistance arises in some, in some rabbit populations. In addition, self-spreading vaccines are of interest for use as medical countermeasures in the event of a global catastrophic biological event, yet their current use is limited to non-human species, including for preventing the spread of myxoma virus among rabbits. Observing how these vaccines work in rabbit populations with myxoma virus can give insight into how these vaccines could work for future human use during um, a catastrophic biological event. Um, and these are our references. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for listening to our presentation. Thank, thank you. you.
Thank you.